<laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Renee. Um, for those of you that, that um, don't know me, I'm the Administrative Director for the SHARE Network at the University of Chicago, and I'm very excited to be joined um, here by Dr. Landy. And I wanted to just introduce a little bit about what the program is going to be and just a little bit about Dr. Landy. Um, you know, as we age, we tend to become more aware of common diseases um, associated with aging. One of those that affects older adults that's very common is arthritis, which causes joint pain, stiffness, and swelling. Um, arthritis is one of the body's natural reactions to disease or injury and is very common um, as we get older. The good news is that it can be managed, and that's what Dr. Landy is here to share with you. Um, she's going to provide an overview of aging and arthritis and will include primary symptoms, how to diagnose, how a diagnosis is made, care and management, um, and when to see your provider and ways to also reduce risk factors. A little bit about Dr. Landy. She's an assistant professor of medicine here at the University of Chicago, medicine and biological sciences in the section of geriatrics and palliative medicine. That is a mouthful, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and she has been practicing here in U Chicago for three years. She Her special interests are an age-friendly approach to shared decision-making and serious illness communication. Without further ado, here's Dr. Landy. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, so let me pull this up. So yes, thanks so much for having me. Um, I am excited to present on this topic and uh, let's just go ahead and get started. Leave plenty of time for discussion. Let me get my mouse to work. Okay, so we are going to be talking about a couple of things sort of not necessarily in this order, but all of this will come up. Um, we're going to talk about different types of arthritis and the numbers, the scope of the problem, essentially. We'll discuss how arthritis impacts aging and how aging impacts arthritis. And then we'll discuss some treatment uh, approaches to treatment. So about, in, so when I, in this talk, I will mainly be uh, focusing on osteoarthritis and aging. Um, it is the most common um, and, and yet can be difficult to manage, but there are options. Um, about 73% of people living with, uh, living um, with osteoarthritis are older than 55 and 60% are female. There are other forms of arthritis. Um, one in particular, a class called like inflammatory arthritis, um, a common one that a lot of folks know about is rheumatoid arthritis. It's an autoimmune condition. That's about 8% of folks um, with arthritis. Gout can also cause arthritis and pseudo gout. And then there are many, many, many other types. And so again, I'm just going to highlight when I say arthritis throughout this talk, I am now talking about osteoarthritis throughout. Um, I'll talk about some moments when um, we should be thinking about something else or that uh, would prompt your clinician to think about something else and do a little bit uh, more of a workup uh, if there are those concerns. Um, but for those who feel the symptoms of, of arthritis, um, uh, around half say those symptoms are moderate to severe, that they limit their usual activity and that their symptoms are every single day. And about a third say it interferes with their day-to-day -day lives. So um, a very big deal. I like to start off by just setting the stage and sort of like grounding us in at least my, my philosophy when I have medical students with me, residents, you name it, when I'm talking to my patients, just because something is common does not mean it is normal. And so oftentimes in clinic, um, either a learner will say it or a patient will say it that, oh, it's, it's, I don't even bring it up because it's normal for age or, um, a lot of my patients just internalize this as well. And they don't bring up their pain all the time because it's, I think, because it has been said to them, well, I mean, you are blank and that I like right away when I have learners, I, just because it is common does not mean that it is normal. Osteoarthritis is not a normal knee. It's not a normal hip. We're not going to call it that. And so I like to sort of set, uh, set the tone uh, right off the bat and talks for about this and other things that may be common in older adults, but certainly not normal. So when we're talking about joint pain and osteoarthritis, um, it is not in an an inevitable consequence of aging. So back to that last slide, right? It doesn't have to happen or it doesn't have to happen to everybody, but it's certainly, um, there are things that happen with aging. Um, one is changes to the joint function. So our joint will function differently and it's any joint, but, it, um, 
our joints will function differently if the muscles around them are changing. So if our muscles, um, if there's what's called sarcopenia or the loss of muscle and weakness, then our joint will uh, sort of make changes to try to compensate for that. That's something that happens in aging. Also um, with aging, the what's called proprioception of, or our body's awareness of where it is in space and time and, and being able to take that step and, not, and, and feeling it and everything that you need to do and balance are impacted as we get older and that impacts our joint function. And then also with aging, there's impact to the joint tissue itself. So when we think about to like even a cellular level of the bones, muscles, tendons, those change as well chondrocytes, the cells that are in our bone that make bone become more, um, it more so in a breakdown mode than a building mode that, uh, that impacts our joints as well as our ligaments and tendons stiffen, and that can impact our joints. So those things do happen with aging, but all the findings of osteoarthritis, which I'll show you in a picture on the next slide, um, are all are from those changes that we see in aging, which is why age is a risk factor for our osteoarthritis. It's not the only risk factor. Um, the other ones are joint injury. If you have ever had an injury, Injury to a joint, whether you've broken something, torn something, a meniscus, a, a rotator cuff decades ago, um, that injury is a risk factor later on for osteoarthritis. Obesity as well, genetics, um, it can run in families and of course, different types of arthritis as well. Uh, the shape of our joint, just the anatomy, some people's anatomy from a ver very early age was already putting them at risk for osteoarthritis. Sex is also a risk. Uh, it's more common in females, like mentioned on the previous slide. And then um, overuse from repetitive movements of a joint. So that's like the wear and tear. So not all osteoarthritis is necessarily wear and tear, but there certainly is um, the risk factor, you know, say a shoulder for someone who played baseball for decades, um, that could definitely put them at risk for uh, osteoarthritis in the future. So when you take the things that happen with aging, it happens, uh, we know about it. It's from the, it's at the biological level. And then you add these other risk factors, some of which you can modify, some of which you cannot, you can't change your genetics. Um, that all then comes together and can lead to uh, osteoarthritis. And the symptoms can be one or all of these. Um, it, it's a spectrum. It can be it can be stiffness, pain. Maybe it's mild pain, moderate, severe. Maybe it's not every day, or maybe it is. Um, maybe it's not every every moment of every day. It's where other people feel it every single moment. Um, so it's really a spectrum. Some folks can experience swelling, a tenderness, and some days could be better than others with those two. Stiffness when getting out of bed or um, sitting for a long time, those initial couple first steps or a couple minutes can be more stiff than later on. And then that crunching feeling, the cracking, the sound of the bone running on bone is also a symptom of arthritis. And so the goal of treatment, one is we have to bring it up, right? So I, um, I encourage like all the learners who are with me too, like we're asking about this, we're not going to just normalize this, um, but also... Um, asking patients to tell us how things are going. And I, I like to focus on things, uh, more aspects of someone's life than pain level and pain level only, the zero to 10. It is very hard to bring somebody's pain to zero. Um, and I try to set expectations for that because that our expectations can really impact the ultimate uh, success of our treatment. Um, so I like to also focus on function. I'll show you a score that I use later, but uh, function, enjoyment, and then literally anything else that's important to somebody. And that's how we can tell. So there's actually a patient of mine who we don't necessarily bring up pain, like the number, um, but we can tell how we're doing in the treatment of her pain by a couple things. Like, was she able to go to her dance class and was she able to play with her grandchildren. If those two things are happening, um, we have agreed uh, based off of what her goals are, that that means her treat, her pain is being well treated. And we never even bring up a number. So it really just depends um, on your individual plan with your provider. 
And again, we care about it because uh, it can lead to a, a, a sort of a chain of events if it goes on long enough untreated. And it mainly starts off with that decreased physical activity. Once it once something hurts, um, it is understandably hard to continue to want to move through it. Um, and so it can lead to decreased activity and then sort of everything else after that. Um, it, if there's weakness that comes after that or poor balance, th then we can think about loss of independence or function, um, maybe falls, or even the fear of falling. Um, even if my patient's never fallen, if I ask them, are they afraid? And they say, yes, that is actually a risk of falling, just having the fear. Um, I'll go to mood in a second. Um, it can lead to low energy because as we start to do less, our energy goes down as well. And then isolation, if you're not going to be going out or socializing or doing the things that you used to do. Um, and it can lead to mood problems, particularly depression. Um, it's sort of the association can honestly go both ways. Um, somebody who has depression, whether diagnosed or undiagnosed, could cert, um, could certainly have trouble with pain management. And then also having uncontrolled pain can lead to depression. And so they're really, really connected. And that's because our brain is connected to our body, right? We have like we have a uh, healthcare and then we have mental health care. Like ideally they're together because they're attached. Um, and our brain is very, very powerful. And so, um, we, I have, uh, with a lot of my patients who live with chronic pain, I screen them for depression. I try to catch it. If it's there, I try to bring it up if it's more subtle. And I try to be very clear that I am not saying your pain is in your head. That's not where I'm going with this. It's just more so like, the, the prevalence of depression. It's just so common with chronic pain that it would be irresponsible for me not to ask about it. And so the diagnosis, it's, it, it, there's only so, you know, many things we have to do to be able to diagnose it. Oftentimes I'll start with the history and physical, which means I will listen. And then the next slide I'll tell you, I'll show you like all the things I tend to ask. Um, but the history is when you're sitting there with me, and we're going through how it all started and how's it feeling and your story of it. And then my physical exam. And then what we typically do is we'll start with x-rays. Um, and then we may have to progress to MRIs or CTs or CAT scans. And so questions that your clinician may ask you about um, regarding your pain. So one is like, where is the pain? Does it radiate anywhere? So like, is it staying right there or does it shoot anywhere else, radiate anywhere else? When did it start? Um, have you had it before? What treatments have you tried? And then I sort of take an inventory. Okay, you tried this, did it work? Did you try this, did it work? Um, because what I certainly don't wanna do is create a plan of like three things and then lo and behold, you've already tried all of those things and they don't work. <laughs> um, and so I wanna know what's worked. And sometimes hearing what has worked and what hasn't worked, um, helps me decide actually what it is too. Um, and so that's that's a really helpful question. I like to know the trajectory over time. Has it stayed the same, gotten better, gotten worse? Is the pain constant? Uh, what brings on the pain? Is it worsened by all of those activities there? Lying to uh, sitting, going up and down stairs, standing, walking, anything make it better. Again, it's not, it's asking for a purpose. If certain things make the pain better or make it worse, um, or if it's constant or if it's triggered, it helps me sort of in my Rolodex of what could the diagnosis be, helps me uh, put things more in the front versus push things in the back just based off of the story. Um, I like to know whether the pain is worse at a particular time of the day. And then does the pain cause you to stop activities? And if so, what activities? Again, fact finding so I can make the diagnosis, but also starting to make a little bit of a list of these activities that you might want to get back to. And that could be part of our treatment goals. And so for the next, uh, I think it's how many joints? One, two, three, four, five, six. So for the next six slides, um, we're going to be going through different areas of the body and where osteoarthritis tends to be. Um, the first, we, we'll start with neck pain. We'll start from the top. Um, so a mechanical neck pain, that's really talking about the osteoarthritis of the spine. We have the vertebrae making up our spine. It's supposed to have these like soft, cushy discs in between to be these cushions. Um, and what happens over time is that, um, those, uh, discs, they can become, uh, dehydrated or dry out and they can shrink. And I have, oh, where's my... 
Oh, okay. That's okay. It's on a different side, the disc one. Um, but uh, so then all of a sudden those nice cushions between our vertebrae are not there as cushiony as they used to be. And it can cause stiffness, loss of flexibility and pain. There can also be overgrowth of bone. Um, and I'll show it on the, the time when I get down to the lower back um, that can come, a, come along with osteoarthritis as well. But that typically stays right here. You can hear like the cracking sometimes when you go left or right, up and down. Um, the pain though stays there. I will say a common cause of headaches is the arthritis of your of your cervical spine, your neck, and it because it, it travels up the back of the head. So when I have someone who has daily headaches or morning headaches, I typically uh, will start to ask about their neck and my patients are like, no, I said my head hurts. Um, but the thing is, is that if the story, depending on how your symptoms sort of sound and, and the way that they're described can make me think that it's actually coming from your neck causing the headaches. And we, uh, there was a gentleman who was having horrible debilitating headaches and that's what we figured out it was. He saw a pain anesthesia doctor and there's a particular nerve that if they can address that nerve um, and, and sort of stop the connection through and they do injections, um, then, then that sort of feedback from the neck to the, the head saying like, I have pain, here's your headache. They stopped that conversation and his, um, with some injections and his, he doesn't have headaches anymore. So it's been a, and he has cut down on two of his pain medicines. So it's been like quite the success story, which has been lovely. Um, uh, there's also cervical, which is neck radiculopathy, meaning um, the nerve is now like pinched or compromised. And that's why patients will have like the pain that radiates down the arm, or they'll say like, it's, it could be a shoulder pain, but really it's coming from the neck and traveling down, or it can be like a weakness in the arms and the hands, right? Cause those, that note, those nerves are telling the muscles what to do in the arms and the hands. And there can sometimes be a numbness. Um, that would be that either the arthritis changes are getting quite advanced to the point where they're compressing and pinching nerves, or you've actually herniated a disc into the nerves. Um, the other thing to consider when it comes to neck pain, and I will say this is for all the pains um, in most of the joints, um, is there are arthritis conditions, like I mentioned earlier, that can affect more areas of the body and also organs. Um, one of those, like we mentioned earlier, is rheumatoid arthritis that has a completely different treatment plan. It's autoimmune. Polymyalgia rheumatica is a condition also that a rheumatologist would help us diagnose. Um, it is a stiffness and a pain in the shoulders and the hips in particular. And all of a sudden the inability to stand up from a chair due to significant weakness. And then when that person uh, tries to walk, um, then like it, it's a little bit better. So that that's also a very rheumatologic condition can have its own one hour lecture. Um, but uh, something that a lot of geriatricians keep in mind because it is common in older adults. And then finally, um, any other inflammatory condition. Um, but really, we're just thinking right now of osteoarthritis in the neck. Shoulder pain is tricky. And I wanted to highlight why that is. And that's because a lot live in the shoulders. So um, hopefully this picture is clear on your end. Um, but if we if we look just at the the three the bones to think about for shoulders, um, we have our scapula that's on the back here um, coming in to meet the uh, head of the humerus for that ball and socket joint there, the glenohumeral joint. We also have our acromion coming around. We also have our clavicle coming around. And then if I followed it all the way this way, it would hit our sternum right here in the center. So we have all these bones that could have things going on. And then we have all these joints. We have where the clavicle and the acromion meet. So you can have AC joint arthritis. You can have ball and socket, glenohumeral joint arthritis. And you can even have where the clavicle goes to meet the sternum on the chest. You can have arthritis there in pain. Then we think about this bursa here, and I'm going to talk about bursas a lot throughout this um, because these bursas are these little um, like gel, I, the way to describe them is like they're these little gel like pocket, uh, little uh, uh, gel 
things that help slide like so your tendons and everything can slide nicely they're just these like lovely cushions that serve a wonderful wonderful role and you can see here like you have one muscle underneath the blue we have one muscle above you have bone and it's just there for lovely cushion and the issue is that that can get inflamed and that could be the whole reason why you're having hurt uh, pain is because of inflammation of this bursa then we have our biceps tendon when we make our muscle like this, um, and it comes in and here's the tendon um, that can be causing us pain. And then on top of all of that, we have what is called our rotator cuff. Our rotator cuff sounds like one thing, but it's actually made up of four different muscles and tendons. It's made up of our subscapularis, our supraspinatus, our infraspinatus, and our teres minor, and it all comes together. And here's that bone we talked about, the acromion. Here's our humerus coming in for ball and socket. Here's our bicep. So it's a very, very complicated joint with a lot going on. Um, and the most common issue is the rotator cuff, these four muscles and tendons. People may have torn their rotator cuff, whether recently or a long time ago, or they may have a tendonitis. The tendon is inflamed. That's the ending, meaning itis, the inflammation of their uh, rotator cuff tendon. Um, and like I said, you could also have inflammation of this bursa here, which you could see would seem very similar to rotator cuff because it's all coming in together at the same exact place. The other thing you could have is bice a bicep tendon right here. You could tear it or you could have uh, inflammation of it as well. You could have uh, arthritis of this joint here. You could also have frozen shoulder that's known as ad it's adhesive capsulitis. That means that all of a sudden, this isn't like something that creeps up on you. It is like all of a sudden you can't even like move your shoulder. It's frozen. And the, the reason why I know that that's what it is when I see people is that usually when people have arthritis or any of the tendons are inflamed, they may not be able to move it, but I can move it for them. The difference with frozen shoulder is I can't even move it either. It is like, it is frozen. The capsule is frozen. And that needs like immediate physical therapy to start as quickly as possible. So you, so you can try to get as much range of motion back as possible. Some orthopedics will inject the shoulder with a steroid to see if that helps. I think the data is a little hit or miss with that, but it is a pretty low risk uh, procedure to get a, an injection in the shoulder for possible benefit. So it may not be a bad idea. And then um, we already talked about all the the bone issues that we could have just on these two little bones that meet. Let's see the pictures, I think. Okay, perfect. The elbow, I won't spend a lot of time on the elbow. Um, I have a graphic here. So this would be like your funny bone here. If your arm is flexed at 90 degrees, um, you could have arthritis in this ball and socket here, right? Your, uh, from your shoulder, it comes down meets your forearm and all this blue should just be this lovely gliding material that's soft and shiny. Um, and with arthritis, uh, that start that, um, degenerates or breaks down and is lost. There's this bursa again, uh, serve this lovely purpose of helping things guide, uh, glide smoothly, but unfortunately it can also get inflamed for all the bursitis issues, all the bursa that you'll see for the rest of these slides, injections of steroids there can be very, very helpful. Sometimes people will try uh, over-the-counter NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen or naproxen. In geriatrics, we get a little bit worried about those because it there is an increased risk of um, stomach lining issues like bleeding, um, bleeding issues in general, the kidneys um, in older adults. So we try to avoid it at all costs. So if I can have a patient get an injection and they're okay with it in the bursa there, that's the, that's the best because that injection will stay right there. It's not going to go throughout the whole body. So your lining of your stomach is okay. Your kidneys are okay. Um, and then there's some other like tennis elbow and golfer's elbow. It's like on the inside and on the outside of your, of your elbow. It also could just be pain that's being referred from your neck or your shoulder. So that's something that the orthopedics or your primary care, I'll try to like suss out too. I'm like, okay, is it like, is it your shoulder? I'll, I'll be like, they'll talk about their elbow, but I'll start examining their shoulder. And they're like, you're not listening to me. It's my elbow. But I'm like, no, 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 I know. But sometimes the elbow pain can be actually shoulder pain that's radiating down. Um, hands. So we could have um, arthritis of our, um, of our uh, joints. Um, 
we think about osteoarthritis mainly um, when it's asymmetric. So one hand has different things than the other hand going on. We can get arthritis in the joints um, here. And hopefully you can see me because I'm doing a lot of hand motions, but here and here at the two, like the proximal and the distal uh, joints of your finger, it's uh, like a lot of swelling and pain on both hands, just at the knuckles uh, could be a rheumatoid arthritis. So um, hand pain and swelling uh, definitely draws my attention just to make sure I'm not missing a rheumatoid because there's such classic findings on the hands that you don't want to miss. Um, gout could be a reason for hand pain. And then vein tenosynovitis is where people will have a very distinct pain right at the base of their, of their thumb, um, mainly with trying to move. And so I'll have patients grip their thumb like this in the exam room, and then I'll, tr I'll try to flex, I'll try to extend it, like stretch it out and it hurts. And that's how I know it's the vein tenosynovitis responds very well to injections. Um, carpal tunnel is a uh, very, very, very common in older adults. There is a small tunnel right here in the wrist where all of these nerves and the nerve and these tendons are trying to make their way through. Um, and that can get very tight. And so when that happens, the nerve that is being compressed is giving signals to the thumb the index finger and the middle finger. So a lot of the pain and numbness or tingling will be in these three fingers in particular. And that's how we know. And the first thing to do is uh, to try night splints. So um, like braces to help keep your wrist straight. So you're not sleeping like this because the tunnel's already tight and now we bend our wrists. So at night, if you can sleep with them in those splints, it can help keep the tunnel open and hopefully reduce your symptoms. If not, they also will try injections right into that tunnel of steroid to calm things down. And if it responds well to the steroid, that means that that was actually the problem. And the hand surgeon may offer you a carpal tunnel release. They'll go in and open up that tunnel for you to relieve it. And then finally, trigger finger. Trigger finger is because, so that's when your finger gets stuck um, in the flex position and it's hard to bring it back up. And that's because our tendons <clears throat> are coming in here and they can get fibrosed, very thick um, with nodules. And so when the finger goes down to be flexed, a nodule can get stuck and it, it, it just has a hard time. And when it finally releases back up, it's because that nodule is able to sort of squeeze back through. Um, but that's why, that's why trigger finger happens. Also can be addressed with uh, with orthopedics. Uh, they can do injections as well. You'll sort of learn that steroid injections are quite lovely and can be helpful for a lot of things. Um, hips. So hip. Um, uh, all conditions of the hip is you know you can have pain in the on the thigh, in the groin area, on the buttocks, and even the knee. So sometimes someone's knee pain is actually not their knee; it's their hip. The most common cause of hip pain is osteoarthritis. Sometimes the lower back can be um, causing a thigh pain um, that like sort of travels around and down the thigh. And it's not a hip issue, but it's a, it's a back issue. And that's where your primary care, your orthopedic will be teasing that out before they're doing like injections or like for sure they'll know the difference before like a surgery. Um, the thing that I wanted to point out is trochanteric bursitis. So we're back to a bursa. Um, here on the left is a bursa that's <laughs> that's acting normal so that this tendon and this muscle can just glide right over it and not rub on the, on the bone, but that bursa can get inflamed. And I had a patient come in recently and it's, it's quite common. It's exquisite tenderness on the side of your hip. They'll come in and point to the side of their hip and say, it hurts right here. When I press it, I can't sleep on it. Um, they may have pain traveling down the side of their leg or on their thigh all the way to the knee even. And she actually had this very classic presentation. I could take my finger, press it right on that bursa. And she's like, that's the pain. And she goes, and it radiates all the way down and it goes all the way to my knee. And so uh, we're going to help her get an injection of this bursa. That's different from hip pain from osteoarthritis. If you see here, the, the ball and socket is actually more in the middle. So people will have a groin pain more so than like a side hip pain when it comes to osteoarthritis of the hip. And I'll show you here. Here's osteoarthritis. <clears throat> this is happening in all the joints when we say osteoarthritis. 
you can see how there, there's not a lot of room anymore in this ball and socket. There's usually a little bit more space. So it's a narrow joint space. The cartilage that should be shiny and easy to move across has uh, is destroyed. And then the arthritis is also classically known for its bone spurs, these overgrowths of bone here. So you can see it's no longer a nice, smooth surface for things just to glide nicely. Not only are you lacking cartilage and you're really close together, but now you're really close together of something with a bunch of bone spurs. So that's all the grinding that you hear and the pain that you feel. And then knee pain. So um, most common cause again of knee pain is osteoarthritis. Um, the front of the knee, uh, here's a picture. I thought this was really good also <clears throat> of the knee. On the left here is a normal knee, beautiful cartilage, uh, easy to go uh, slide between uh, meniscus to shock absorbers, helpful to also help with easy gliding coming from the femur. Look at all that joint space. There's a nice little gap there. So nothing has to be touching all the time. But then here's arthritis. Cartilage is lost. Um, we have our bone spurs forming and now it's a tight fit. There's no more space. And so not only again, are you going to have these bone spurs and no cartilage, but now it's in such close proximity. They're always touching. That's that bone on bone, which is osteoarthritis. Um, People can have um, front of the knee pain. So sorry, I, I wish this was like the other way. I'll show you a better picture in a second. But where on the right, where all these words are and in red, the bursitis, this is the front of the knee. Over here on the left is the back of the knee. The femur's coming down. There's a bursa right in front of your, uh, your platella and there's one right below it. And these can have bursitis as, uh, uh, yeah, like an inflammation of the bursa there. Um, and so that can be helpful with an injection. You can also have patellar femoral pain, which is where there's too much friction between the patella and the femur because that cartilage is destroyed. So it's just rubbing bone on bone between your kneecap and your femur. And then you can see all the bursa, right? Like you could have this one inflamed. This is in front of your kneecap. This is under your kneecap. And then there's this one bursa below your kneecap and towards the middle of your body um, that can also be inflamed. This is a common one that can be inflamed as well. And people may have back of the knee pain because they get a baker cyst. And that's when all the fluid from this arthritis, it uh, pokes out and to become a cyst outside of the joint space it becomes a cyst in the back of the knee. It's not dangerous, um, but it could be painful. And if it gets big enough, I mean, there are nerves trying to come, come through the back and things like that. So some people will have it um, drained because it just becomes uncomfortable. But I had a patient the other day who was like, what is this? And we felt it. I'm like, oh, that's a Baker cyst. She's like, well, it doesn't hurt me. I'm like, then we're just going to leave it alone. And then um, a fusion is when people's knee looks really swollen and it's because fluid, all this fluid built up in the knee and there's only so much space that it can fit in. I mean, this is a, these joint spaces are not huge. Um, and so this can be really painful to have an effusion. And that's when sometimes before a steroid injection, um, your primary care or your orthopedic or rheumatologist, whoever you see, they'll actually take out the fluid first to relieve your knee of that pain, that alone will help with your knee pain. But then they'll also then inject a corticosteroid to help with the inflammation. But just getting that fluid out is very relieving. Um, and then of, uh, I'll actually mention it later, Never mind. So, um, and then last uh, area is the, the lower back. This again, this one could definitely have its own whole lecture. Um, you can have the osteoarthritis of the spine. Here's what it would look like. So nice, healthy disc up here. Look how like blue and just nice and cushiony and then lack of blue. So the blue is gone or it's minimal. There's bone growth. Now, all of a sudden there's excess bone on the side, all this bone here. And, um, and the space is very narrow. People can also have back pain because of a herniated disc. You can see how this nice blue disc, it pops out the back, it herniates and it presses on that spinal cord and that's why it hurts. And if, if you've ever heard of yourself or somebody else has lumbar stenosis, that means that where the spinal cord is, where my mouse is, it's being protected by our beautiful uh, uh, vertebrae, the bones are, uh, of our spine. It's here being protected, um, but unfortunately with osteoarthritis changes, all those bone spurs that we saw in the hip and the knee, they can also form here and it's a tight fit. 
And so when those bone spurs appear in the, in the vertebrae, um, it can pinch on the spinal cord. And that's, that's what spinal stenosis, that cord doesn't have a lot of room. It's stenosed. There's sciatica coming from the back, this massive sciatic nerve trying to leave a very tight space. There's a lot of muscles here that go across it. Um, and it can cause a lower back pain that radiates down the leg. And then we can also have vertebral compression fractures. Um, these are uh, these are from osteoporosis, um, can just happen on their own just because of weakened bone. And before I go to the ending here, I, I will just say that things to look out for and, and what providers should be thinking about, and, and I've seen all my colleagues do this, is like, you know, if it's the most likely after an x-ray and every everything is osteoarthritis, um, that is fine. We go physical therapy, we get an x-ray. And then I say, let's come get, come back in six to eight weeks. If it's not better, then we need to take the next step, which would be a CAT scan or an MRI. This, the last two are not there to scare you. Um, it could be in any joint. I just happen to put it for this one. Um, the infection of a joint is usually pretty clear to all of us. It has a very classic, it's red, it's hot. Um, make, people have fevers or chills. They can't walk on the joint that's infected. But we always should be keeping in mind that tumors can be in the bone too, whether it's a, it's a cancer of the bone or it's a cancer that has spread to the bone. And so, you know, if I'm treating someone for osteoarthritis and everything I'm doing isn't working, then we should get additional imaging to make sure we're not dealing with something else. So this was, again, not to, to make anyone particularly worried about pain being cancer, um, but that uh, to keep that in everyone's mind. And so we really want to fill our toolbox, our, um, our treatment toolbox. Um, so sometimes we only have one thing in there, maybe that's Tylenol, which could be good, but we want to make sure we fill it with a lot of tools because it usually takes a lot of things to address pain, especially on those bad days. So here's a, the treatment plan that I use with patients. Um, uh, my colleagues developed it at the University of Chicago, and I bring this paper out and we go through it. And this is how I know what they've tried, if it worked, if it didn't work. But we really try to use the mind and non-medicine things if we can. Heat and cold are very good options. Um, TENS units, the little stimulators, the little stickers that you can put on a joint. The data is plus minus, but if, it, if it's affordable for somebody and it can work, it's very low risk. And so I'm still, I'm very much open to it. Being active, walking, exercise, we'll talk about that in a second. But then using the mind, distraction, progressive muscle relaxation, which is closing your eyes and going from like head to toe, uh, trying to relax one muscle after the next um, and, and trying to use our mind to uh, essentially find like a mindfulness um, and centering moment to get through particularly bad days of pain or a bad moment. And then meditation and prayer. We have in-person treatments that are not medicines. Um, anything moving in physical therapy is helpful. Talk therapy is good too. I mean, pain is hard to deal with on a daily basis and we need to fill up our toolbox of how we're going to cope with this. Um, and so talk therapy is helpful. A uh, chiropractor can be helpful for certain conditions. I would definitely talk to your doctor about that. Um, massage therapy, acupuncture is getting good data out there about acupuncture. I talked a lot about injections and then of course, surgery sometimes if it's needed. And, and the doctor really thinks that like for your goal, this will help. Sometimes my patients, um, their goal is for pain relief. And I do appreciate the surgeon saying, you know, when I do this surgery, it will do blank, but it may not help with your pain. And that's actually not what this surgery is known for. And I think that's really important because how tragic if you're going in for a surgery, thinking it's going to help with your pain and they knew all along, it wasn't. Um, and so being very clear with the surgeon before surgery, being like, what are the goals of this surgery? Cause here are my goals. And then all the topical creams, <laughs> that are helpful for folks, um, diclofenac being an anti-inflammatory. And then we have a lot of medicine options all from Tylenol to Cymbalta, which is a mood and pain medication, affects her the same way. Uh, gabapentin and Lyrica are nerve pain medicines. I don't use carbamazepine very often. I don't come across that very often in, in, in folks. Um, so I'll skip over that. We are trying medical marijuana for some patients to see if it could help, particularly focusing on CBD. Um, I do try to avoid naproxen and ibuprofen um, because of the risk in older adults. Baclofen, if it's truly a muscle spasm issue, um, if it's not a muscle spasm issue, I don't use baclofen. And then there are opioids um, as well if needed uh, to achieve goals. 
And so here's all the, I put all the like non-medicine options and like exercise, exercise, exercise. Motion is lotion for the joints, particularly when we're dealing with osteoarthritis. Yoga and Tai Chi have really good data behind it. Um, weight loss data shows that 5%, if it's applicable to somebody, 5% weight loss can be helpful for pain and function. Uh, a tibiofemoral knee brace for knee arthritis, a hand um, brace for thumb arthritis, acupuncture, massage, um, and again, cognitive behavioral therapy. That's therapy with a psychologist or a psychiatrist to help uh, fill your coping toolbox. And then here's how I like to assess pain. Like I said earlier, how we're doing with treatment. I ask about pain, but I also ask about how is the pain interfering with your enjoyment of life? And then how is it interfering with your daily activities? Um, here's just some recommendations for activities as I wind down. Um, it's either 150 minutes to 300 minutes a week of moderate intensity or 75 minutes to 150 of vigorous activity is the guideline. Um, and start, start, you know, low, go slow. It doesn't have to happen in one day and any physical activity is better than none. So if you can't hit this number, doesn't mean we, it's not an all or nothing. And here are some activities. If you're, if you have osteoarthritis, you want to do things that are low impact, um, right? Because if you think of the bone and the joint space, so things that are low impact, low pounding on, um, on the knees or the hips. So a lot of, whether it's water or walking, um, uh, dancing, it doesn't have to be something that you think about as being like exercise. It could be a day of gardening. If you're digging, lifting and carrying, like you exercised. <laughs> um, so you can also make it into things that you like. And I will stop there. I do have a section on opioids just because it's common, but I, I won't talk about it unless it's uh, something that people want to talk about. So I will open it up for any discussions here. What is your phone number? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can put our uh, clinic phone number in the... <laughs> in the chat where I'm, I'm, I should have said that I'm, I'm at the South shore senior center, all my colleagues and all of us at the senior center. Um, I really adore working with them. So, um, yeah. I, uh, I've recently experienced some shoulder pain and, uh, was wondering, uh, was several decades of uh, playing tennis and racquetball, the major contributor. I've had a report of a bone spur and narrowing cartilage in my right shoulder. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, one is change over time with age that we know, but then if we think about that repetitive motion, I think you you would fall into probably the the bucket of like the wear and tear over time. Um, obviously that activity, um, there were a lot of pros to that activity, right? I think that that level of fitness um, had its his had its advantages, but that shoulder may have gone through a lot as well. Yeah, and if you think about that's like the classic osteoarthritis, you have the bone spurs, you have the, the cartilage breakdown, probably narrowing space. And especially with that, with you said tennis, um, the, the rotator cuff sometimes, like I played volleyball, I'm just, I am like prepared that my shoulder has rotator cuff issues. And so I think I will know that my risk factor will have been wear and tear and injury. Thank you. What are the prognoses for my taking up a uh, uh, paddle ball, pickleball? Pickleball? I mean, I, if I think if it's not causing you pain while you're playing and, you know, the moments after it's not flaring it up too much. I think the motion, I think you could argue motion is lotion. I think you just have to listen to your body. Thank you very much. Yeah. You have to weigh it too, right? Like there's so many benefits for your whole body doing it uh, versus the one joint. And so you just have to weigh. <laughs> You've given us a lot to think about. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is very, very helpful in terms of understanding what I have going on hither, thither, and yon. Uh, you know, stiff fingers. Um, the knees are the real, uh, the real complaint, and I'll be seeing an orthopedist um, 
in a couple, well, not until sometime in April. Um, but it's enough so that uh, it's hard to stand for a long time or um, I, or walk for a long time, so. Yeah, and you know, and thank you for sharing that. I think, um, you know, I think the use of Tylenol heat, all the mindfulness things and, and, and activity, all the things from the in-home or even the in-person treatments that are not medicines, all the creams, um, Tylenol every day, three times a day, whatever, you know, if it's still not getting you where you need and want to be, then I, usually the next step is injections with corticosteroids. You can get those once every three months. Um, there's really no limit to how long you can do every three months uh, to the knee or the hip, um, or particularly the knee. Um, they'll also do it for the shoulder. Um, after that, sometimes people will offer the gel injections for the knee, see if they can put some gel into the knee um, to give more, right? Because you're it's like lacking the cushion, the cartilage is not mm. there. Um, some people get good relief out of the, out of the, um, gel injections, but then after that, you know, knee replacements and hip replacements, um, they have good success. Um, and I always just tell patients, we want to make sure we walk the fine line. We don't want function to be so compromised and live it with it for so long that it makes recovery from a knee or hip replacement too hard. Um, but at the same time, nobody wants to do an early surgery either. So it's, it's making sure that you don't lose too much function if that's ever going to be a possibility because you don't want that road to be overly challenging. Well, I can say this on the knee business. I had injured my knee years ago, did a meniscus repair, which eventually later said you shouldn't do, um, did the steroid injections, did the gel injections, and finally after about four years said, okay, I have had enough and did a knee replacement. I'm over 80, and I have to say, the knee replacement has been great. And recovery has not been horrible, done no problem. Um, luckily, my right and left knee is fine. And I would say, if you're hesitating, go ahead and do it. Repair-wise, you know, it it it's very painful when you do it, but recovery time has been pretty fast for me. And uh, no problems at all. And I wish I had done it earlier. I futzed around for about five or six years with the injections. So go for it, people. I have a question. This is Beverly. What is the difference between the gel injection and a steroid injection, cortisone? And which yeah, one is better? So, yeah. So um, I, I don't know that I know the data in terms of better. I mean, there's even studies showing that physical therapy is in certain people is better than even the steroid injections, but like just the, the medicine of it, corticosteroids is an anti-inflammatory medication. So it's getting in there and trying to reduce the inflammation, reduce the, um, the inflammatory response that your body is having towards the cartilage and the bone production. Um, it, it's not going to be able to reverse what has happened. And we have, we don't have a good way to stop the progression, um, but it can provide anti-inflammatory relief. The gel, itself, the gel itself is like a, a substance. Um, it, it truly, I mean, in the thing, it is a gel substance. I would have to look up the exact, what the medicine actually is or the product actually is, but it is actually trying to act as a cushion. It's not doing anti-inflammatory. It's trying to go in and serve as that cushion that you're now lacking. Okay. Thank you. I see. That's a great question. Do they, do they ever do gel injections into the shoulder? I have a torn rotator cuff. It's been for years, and have done the uh, steroid injections, and have decided I've never to seen it all. Go ahead. I've never seen it, but doesn't mean it doesn't it, exist. Doesn't... So basically, in the shoulder, it's it's just a steroid. Yeah. And surgery is a, is a lot trickier when it comes to the shoulder. It's a very different uh, rehabilitation um, than uh, hips and knees. It's just, you're going through so much muscle and tendon just to get to the shoulder that it's, it's a tough, it's a tough road. I th think, uh, is it Jeannie? Jeannie? Yeah. Jeannie? Oh, that's, 
Oh, somehow it, it remuted you. Try that one more time. <laughs> like it, un, you were unmuted and then it remuted you. Okay. Um, when you went down the skeleton, you uh, didn't mention the pelvis. I did not. Um, that's been sort of the center of a lot of my problem. And so that's what I'm wondering. Is it just the hips that have the problem and the, the lumbar spine? Or is there something specific like the sacrum and uh, other parts there? That, thank you. Um, yeah, I did. I did leave that out. Um, I, there are, um, let me see if my PowerPoint and what is my skeleton? <clears throat> yeah, like the, there are, um, there are connections here and here that can certainly get um, inflamed and have issues. But if we were to flip the skeleton around, you can start to see it's here where the down. sacrum is in the coccyx. That is articulating with the pelvis as well. Um, right. and, and that can also have uh, uh, degenerative changes. But some people also have pretty bad um, just pain in their coccyx. Um, and it's really uncomfortable because it's hard to sit. Um, but, and, and so much of it is made up here of, of the hip as well, where it's meeting the ball and socket that it, the, the pelvis is, is tricky, um, because of where it's situated and it just has a completely different makeup. There's not as many ball and sockets. It's just a lot of connections. And then your, your glutes, which your, is your butt, um, they, it's so many muscles coming together yeah. and the sciatic nerve is trying to make its way out. It's, and then you have your whole pelvic floor on the bottom with these muscles. I mean, it is just a very intricate setup. Yeah. And it can hurt. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Sorry that you're going through that. Gloria, I think you had okay. your hand up. Yes. Um, earlier, you said that uh, physical therapy can often help as much as some other things. And um, I know it's helped me, uh, but... Why is it, what does it do to help? Um, it, it Does it reduce an inflammation or what? It's a great question. Yeah, so we, um, I would say physical therapy, it re really gets to the point that exercise and movement is one of the main and best ways to treat the pain. Um, I think that part of the changes with aging and with an injury in particular, is the changes that your muscles start to make, whether it's weakness or compensating. And so a lot of physical therapy helps you activate and start to recruit other muscles to start to help a joint that is struggling. And so that's how I like to think about physical therapy too, is that it's, it's helping your body recruit things to help. And I think the movement itself, yes, can have an anti-inflammatory impact. Mm. Yeah, the can, strength, flexibility, those things are going to help with pain. Um, yeah, I, uh, I do go to the senior center and I was uh, pres prescribed uh, physical therapy for um, nerve, different nerve pain throughout my body. Mm. I don't know. I don't know what that does to help, but I know that it does plus medication and being exactly. careful. Sometimes Yes. Yeah. And, and nerve pain is, is, can be really mm -hmm. tricky. Um, but I think usually what's nice is the combination of medication and physical therapy can at least reduce it, um, hopefully to goal. Thank you. Um, Sel, I think you have your, your hand up there. I do. Thank you. Um, is there some controversy or something about, um, you said there's no limit to the amount of cortisone injections and, I was limited on those, um, even though every three months I'd gotten maybe three. And um, they said, well, you could be getting necrotic joints now. So we redid an x-ray and they said there's suspicion of the joints becoming necrotic and, steroid, and more steroid injections will make that, increase that. So I stopped, but is that, was that just one person's opinion? No, I appreciate you bringing oh. that up. I think that I, I I need to I need to rephrase. I think that um, let me be thoughtful in what I say because I don't think I was very thoughtful a second ago. I think that like for the 
for the knees in particular, if there really isn't a surgical plan moving forward, I haven't seen orthopedics stop unless of course, when we get x-rays, if it's showing any sign that it's hurting the bone in another way, um, like you were saying, it's called like an avascular necrosis. Um, we can see that in the hip. And so I think there, uh, there's a different attention paid to the hip. Um, so I think if, as long as someone's getting injections and having monitoring, um, and the bones are responding, um, well to it, then you can continue. And especially like for my patients who have, um, debilitating knee pain, joint injections help, they have no intention of getting a surgery. Um, then we keep going with them as long as we possibly can until the bone tells us otherwise. Um, but the avascular necrosis of the hip is definitely something, um, that we would want to monitor for if that were the case. And that would be a reason to stop. So I really appreciate you bringing that up because I should have worded it differently. I just wondered. Thanks. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. And one more thing, there's no gel injections for the hips. Not is that I've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I like to walk. I like to walk a lot and it relieves my hip and knee pain. But at the same time, am, am I wearing out the cartilage? Is there a way to rebuild cartilage? There is not. I mean, I think that ultimately in the orthopedics I've spoken to before, the overall benefit of doing exactly those activities far outweighs and the concern for the progression, I think that the knee is going to progress how the knee is going to progress as long as you're doing the low impact activities that you are doing. Um, now, if you said, well, I go out there and I do something that requires a lot of jumping and a lot of load, I'm like, oh, <laughs> please don't do that. Um, you could actually accelerate it. But I think the benefit of the walking far outweighs um, anything like that. You mentioned CBD. Yeah. Um, everyone I've talked to who's taking it in our community uses it for sleep. Mm. I don't want to get any more tired or more, more mellow. Um, I'd like to have it for pain reduction. How do you use it for pain reduction? Yes. So what I tell people, um, and the, and the folks at the dispensary can be quite helpful too, especially when you're looking, if you're saying strictly for pain, I mean, there are the topical options of CBD, um, which could be a good place to start. But then if you're going to take something, uh, like by mouth or edible, um, what I typically say is that focusing more so on the CBD, not the THC. So CBD right. only product, or at least the equivalent ratio, um, like one to one, but if you can get CBD only, I usually have folks start at like 2.5 milligrams. So typically like a gummy will come as 10. And so I tell them to take a quarter first, just to see how they're, they'll respond. If it makes them, you know, sleepy is usually the thing. Um, it, it, in theory, the CBD really shouldn't have too much of a, cognitive or like wakefulness impact. Cause that's more of the THC. Um, that that's usually my guidance, but we always have to, I'm like, I don't know how you will respond. And so I always just tell people that try it first. If it does work for them, then we can sign up for the, the card itself, the medical marijuana card, because it comes with, um, uh, um, you don't, you can go to the medical line. You don't have to do the, you don't have to stand in the recreational line, but then also there's like a tax deduction as well. So it's cheaper ultimately in the end, but I don't do that with somebody until they've tried it first. And when they know that it works, cause you have to pay for that like long-term. We want to thank you so much. It yeah. was really, um, uh, as someone who's had two knee replacements, I really related to all the things you said and very useful. So wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. No, no, thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah, um, and really informative. Yes, yeah, and it's a very good day much. for a walk today. So I can actually say that after a whole talk about going. <laughs> <laughs> good. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.